Let's try it again. Good morning, everybody. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. How grateful we are to God for the privilege of worship today as we begin what's going to be a very busy day, but we're grateful to God. To all students that are here, um, we do have a few slots available for the luncheon, but we would ask that at the appropriate time, you would then uh, fill out the QR code or respond to the QR code and uh, so we can account you or count you uh, among our number. Uh, has anybody been blessed to be at Ellison Jones this year? It's, it's been it's been amazing, and I'm grateful to God for just the opportunity. As God has walked us from the Jericho Road to chaos and victory over it, how blessed we are. So I'm going to, uh, so I wanted to integrate students into this, into our experience and there's this wonderful couple that are in school together. He's a senior and she is a, a junior headed to be a midler. And I wanted them to lead us in prayer and scripture today. And so uh, I want us to uh, be encouraged that we have amazing students. Yeah. In fact, all of our students, current students, would you stand? All current students. Can we celebrate God for, amen. Please, please don't miss the luncheon today and the opportunity to sit with uh, Dean Emeritus Kenny. So the Austins are coming now to lead us, and then our worship ministry is going to come. And they're going to they're gonna speak to us musically. Then I'll introduce the preacher, and then they'll come back. Amen? Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, I know it's early. Can we clap our hands this morning? I'm going to be reading Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye land. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Come on, church. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. And enter into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. Do I have a witness this morning? I said, for the Lord is good. And his mercy is everlasting. And his truth endure to all generations. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. Now, Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. Father, we ask you to come into this room. Come into this atmosphere. God, we pray, God, that you come in again and allow us to hear from you once more again. In the name of Jesus, we pray, God, that you would begin to infiltrate our thoughts and begin to move and shift things around in us. In the name of Jesus. Father, you've already moved, so God, we ask you to move again. God, you've already spoken, but God, we want to hear from you again. So God, we pray that you would begin to speak, that you would begin to move. In the name of Jesus, and Father, we ask you to do it again. God, we ask you to do it again. We have and anticipation and we have expectation for you to do something that we've not encountered before for you to do something that we've not experienced before and so God we say have your way have your way this morning have your way this morning in the name of Jesus we move flesh out of the way and father we say you get
receive the glory. We are not thieves. So, Father, we give you back your glory. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Come on and clap your hands and give God praise. If you believe that God is about to do something in this place, if you have anticipation, if you have expectation, clap your hands and give God some praise. Come on, praise the Lord, everybody. We're going to sing a quick song. We're going to do it all together. Is that all right? Come on, put your hands on it right here. Come on, everybody. Come on, everybody knows this song. Let's do it right here. Everybody sing hallelujah.
One thing that's been uh, intriguing as people have, people have viewed us, people have viewed us from around the country, and, and they didn't see our praise coming. Okay, you missed your reason to praise. They have viewed us from around the country, and they didn't see our praise coming. Somebody actually texted me and said, are y'all a seminary? I said, the leading one. And, and, and that ain't just my opinion. That's from the experts. Again, thank you all for being here. Can we honor our faculty that's here. Faculty, would you stand? I'm always on the faculty. Come on, faculty, would you stand? Come on, come on. Every student ought to be clapping like you lost your mind. These women and men are stewarding your journey theologically. And I am honored, and you may be seated. I must acknowledge that when I first walked in here, you know, I have my own insecurities. I don't have them now because I is the dean. Right? But I did. I have my own insecurities. I didn't know if I could manage. One of the questions in my interview uh, process was, how can someone with a D-man provide leadership for a faculty with PhDs? And my response was very simple. If the school that birthed me theologically has the ability to give me an opportunity to lead it, then clearly it prepared me to handle whatever I have to handle. So I'm confident, and we do have, we have an amazing faculty. Uh, all of them, and students need to hear this, all of them are vested in your interest. All of them are vested, all of them care, all of them are sages. Uh, I wanna move past the word expert because they're persons of great wisdom. And they have specialties, but they're, but they're men and women of great wisdom and insight. Uh, Ray McKenzie or Dr. Robert, Robert Wafunaka or Dr. Howard, Dr. West, Dr. Tool Chant, those who are in the room now. So I'm honored that I get to walk out this stage of my life with women and men who love God, love students, and love this university. So can we celebrate them one more time? As well, I want us to acknowledge uh, a woman whose husband was and still is a significant part of the fabric of the School of Theology. Mother, Mrs. Lady Nichols, would you stand? Her husband was a dean. He was one of the 11 deans, one of the 11 deans. Dr. Paul Nichols taught me, and walking in his class the first day, uh, now I'm going to tell it because I'm the dean. I could tell it now. Dr. Nichols scared me so bad, I called my mama and said, Mama, I don't think I want to go to this school anymore. He was one of the most brilliant men. And finally, at Founders Day, we are scheduled to honor him as is appropriate to do. And so we, we give God great praise. Again, I want to encourage all of our students to, uh, to take advantage of, of three things. One, and Dr. West, once worship is over, Dr. West will come and we'll just make a, a quick announcement about the Voice of the Customer survey that we need students to participate in. We can only get better if we hear your voices and our own Dr. West is leading that effort university-wide as well as the luncheon. And then finally our vendors. Uh, I, I know our vendors are not strategically, are not physically in this space. So it's hard because they're, they're, they're in Kingsley, but vendors get discouraged when we don't at least make an effort to try to support them, amen? 
So if you don't mind, we'll, we'll create space for that as well. I am, I, I spend a lot of time in prayer about how we should navigate Elephant Dome. It is, it is, the, it is the mother event of Hampton Ministers Conference. There is no Hampton Ministers Conference without Ellison Jones Convocation. I, I, I wish we took pride in the fact that we ain't following nobody. We're leading everybody. Okay, that's when you were supposed to clap. I, I'll be ready to retire when I can say stuff like that and the whole room stands up and howls. So I'm going to try it again. We ain't following nobody. We're the leader in theological education. Ah, uh, y'all still ain't got it. I guess I'll stay another year. See, you could have got my retirement if y'all had just stood up earlier. It's too late now. I'm keeping my job. Here, here, I need to say this as we get ready for the preacher. White media and white institutions have done an amazing job of making black folk not honor their own institution. They make us feel like we need them to be accepted. When we're accepted by the mere fact that God created us and some of the most brilliant people are in historic black theological education spaces. School of Theology is truly that. When I look at Dr. Mary Young, who walked with me as a student through my journey, and now she sits among us again, I am honored that we've had the most amazing people. So I'm going to keep my job because y'all didn't holler loud enough. And I'm praying that y'all don't holler for at least five more years because I like my job. Everybody has people in your life that God positions that nudges you into your authenticity and hears God for you when you can't always hear God. Don't ever be so important that you can't have partners. Don't ever live in the illusion that you're so gifted. People quote, and your gift would make room for you, but somebody got to point you in the direction of the room. And every now and then, God will give other folk the key to the room that your gift will make room for. I worked for the School of Theology, I worked for Baptist General Convention. I was director of youth and evangelism. I don't know, maybe almost 30 years, 30 years ago now. And Dr. Cecil Scott, the late Dr. Cecil Scott, kind of had this awkward, unspoken time line for directors of youth. Three to five years, five years is beyond what he wanted. I think it was about three years. Where my, my three years were coming up. And I had, and I was, I had just been rejected by a church. I was the, hey, <laughs> Bishop Webb, I was the only candidate for a church in Richmond. We ain't gonna call the name. I was the only candidate. I was the only <laughs> candidate. Hey, Dr. Howard, I was the only candidate. I lost to myself. <laughs> I didn't get to church because I didn't get 66%. I got 64.9. And I didn't get to church. I lost to myself. I went into, I went into, I went into a season of discouragement and depression. I'm just trying to manage. How could I get rejected when I was the only one? That's like showing up to your wedding and they say, I don't. <laughs> when they've been saying, I do, the whole time you were engaged. <laughs> Lady McKenna said, it was deep. And Bishop Lee Alfred Thomas, Pastor Lee Alfred Thomas at the time, he took me to lunch. Uh, he, was in, he was in Jacksonville. He was headed back to Jacksonville, Florida. He and his lovely wife was here. And his love said, hey, man, I know a church in Jacksonville, Florida, looking for a pastor. I said, whatever, it's Florida, I'll go. It should be warm, that's cool. I submit my stuff, 
there was like 75, 80 candidates. I ended up being one of the final three and had never gone to the church. Walked in, I, I flew to Florida. I wore shorts and a, a t-shirt because it was November. I figured it was warm. I get off the plane and it's 57 degrees and raining. I said, God, you do not want to send me to this city. It's confused. Interestingly enough, I preached one time. Three weeks later, they called me. I've been there over 27 years. And, and the reason I'm there is because of the Alpha Thomas. The only reason I'm there. He is one of my dearest friends, but that ain't why he's here. He's here because I trust his voice. He's a graduate. He and, and Bishop Rudolph McKissick came from Florida together, graduated together, and they've been my brothers in this journey. And so, this amazing, can we celebrate them? They've been on point. Yeah. They've been on point. And after they sing, Bishop the Alfred Thomas is going to come, pastor of the Open Arms Ch uh, Fellowship Church, and uh, amazing man of God. He's going to come, and he's going to minister the word today. Once he's done, then we're going to transition into what's going to be an incredible day of challenge, of stretching, uh, because I believe today we're going to all be better. So let's put our hands together and receive uh, the rest of our worship experience. God bless you. Come on, let's do it all together from the rise. 
sounds like church to me. And tell somebody he is a blessed Savior. And he's worthy to be prayed. I'm going to try to keep my composure because it sounded like the sound of heaven in him. Tap somebody and say, Jesus, blessed Savior, worthy to be praised. Mm. Yeah, okay, I'm. Father, we bless you today. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you adoration. We give you thanksgiving for this amazing moment, this awesome time. 
thank you for this aggregation of called out ones who are here today to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord and to recognize that he is the savior of the world. Bless us now in this moment and hide us behind the illuminating shadow of your cross that my people may see absolutely none of me but positively all of thee. Transform me now into a vessel that might be manifest of your glory that might speak with clarity, conviction, and compassion. But all, most of all, help me to speak with courage. We bless you and give you praise. In the marvelous and matchless and majestic name of our Christ, we pray. And God's people said, amen. God bless you, and I thank God for this opportunity to our dean and to all of the aggregation of professors and teachers and persons who have been instrumental in our journey. Uh, we say good morning to all of you. And, uh, this is a moment uh, that I never dreamed of being at. But thanks be to God. God has found favor for this hour. I want to acknowledge my queen for 37 years. Lady Sandy in the front. And all of you, my friends, who have gathered from around and classmates, we give God praise for you. I am not going to be long, so catch the train while it's rolling. Uh, in, in, in today's world, uh, knowing what to do in times of crises can give a person or a nation the needed advantage to overcome adverse situations. But a shortfall of not knowing what to do can spell trouble, anxiety, and fear in the midst of uncertainty and a wanting leadership. And this is true in every age since the day man was driven from the Garden of Eden. And this is not different in our days with coronavirus and COVID-19, which came with its unique challenges to the world. However, in times of crises, the bottom line is that those with the understanding of the times tend to offer the antidotes and lead the way out of the minutia caused by the crisis. Such persons who possess these qualities are known as the persons or men and women of the moment, born for a time like these. They are those on the right side of history, stationed in the right place at the right time. They are the ordinary person, sometimes unrecognized by the world, unflattering by the glitters of this world and sacrificial with a servant's heart. They are always ready to stand up for what is just, true, and of virtue dignified with right on their side. In order to get hold of this concept, we need to appeal to the word of God to understand the governing principle that is in short supply in today's world. The, the Bible records the most interesting example of how to address the issues of leadership in crisis management. Therefore, let's start from the days of Israel's monarchy during the transition of power from King Saul to, hum to the humble shepherd boy, David. The situation in Israel at that time became so fluid with changing circumstances due to a defeat and the loss of a king. 
Hence, a crisis was brewing in the horizon that was threatening to tear the nation apart, and David was about to be crowned king of Israel. The king of Israel, Saul, was dead. And the leaders of the tribe of Benjamin wanted one of their own, the son of Saul, crowned as the successor to the throne. But the other tribes thought otherwise. In favor of David, and they met in Hebron to turn the kingdom of Saul over to him. Then there was a time of crisis in the kingdom of Israel, and there was a great need for leadership surrounded by men of great wisdom to discern the times. As leaders are not born out of a crisis, but revealed. Let me try that again. Leaders are not born out of a crisis, but revealed. So at that point rose up 200 identified as the men and leaders of the tribe of Issachar. They were men who understood what was happening and knew exactly what to do. In fact, 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32 says, From the tribe of Israel, there were 200 leaders of the tribe with their relatives. All these men understood these signs of the times and knew the best course for Israel to take. Which brings me to my title today. In fact, I need you all to help me understand that in order for a shifting and a transitioning in the earth as we know it, that the people of God who are the anointed of God, those who are of us who are gathered in this room, who are being trained and who are being taught the unadulterated things of God through theological training, we are the ones who have been called out from amongst them and and we need what I would suggest, the Ishakar anointing. In the Hebrew language, the word used in that passage for understanding is binar. It comes from a root word that means to separate something mentally and to di differentiate its component parts. It is used to describe a situation when one has insight into a smaller circumstance and acts with prudence. It also reveals the presence of intelligence and wisdom and the knowledge of the spiritual skills of life. This is a situation when someone understands the facts of a matter with clarity and knows what is at stake. It means that the men and the people of Issachar have the ability and capacity to use the spiritual gift freely given to all men by the eternal one. Given to all persons by the one who made us and know all about us. Also, they were not ashamed to use the God-given skill to analyze what was happening at the time. What it meant and what must be done. Also, these men of Issachar could discern the times. They could analyze the times using the prophetic word of God. So they knew, watch this, the climate and had perceived the correct, correctly the consequences of what those times were all about. Based on that, the men or sons of Issachar, y'all, knew what to do. They understood what was happening in the larger picture. They knew, watch this, that Saul had not been a good king. They, they knew what the word of God says about a king who has failed the test. They also knew that establishing a line of Saul as dynasty or keeping the kingship in the tribe of Benjamin was contrary to the commands of God. Besides that, they knew that David, by virtue of the tribe as of Judah, character and ability was the true leader Israel needed during their turbulent times. They were assigned the duty, watch this, of prophetic discernment. 
th their mission was to be able to observe, listen, and to ultimately discern the time and to know what the will of God was for God's people at any given period of time. These descendants of Issachar were bold men, brave men, uncompromising men, unwavering men. These men were uh, put in place in critical, crucial, and crisis-filled times in which we live. Times of turmoil, turbulence, and tragedy. These are times of confusion, calamity, corruption, and chaos. These are times of frustration, falsehood and failures which are indicators of something shifting in our midst that demands attention from leaders who are in tune and in touch with the times in which we are living. We have watched in horror as movies went from cursing to bleeping out cursing to promoting vile profanity. We have watched in horror as dancing went from the twists to the bump to the grind to anything goes. We have watched in horror as pornography went from illegal to age appropriate to free web access. We have watched in horror as dating couples went from kissing to shacking up to multiple partners and free sex. In generations past, we looked up to men like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Desmond Tutu, and Nelson Mandela. But today, our young men are looking up to Jay-Z, Lil Wayne, the Migos, Drake, Snoop Dogg, Diddy, and 2 Chains. In the fabric of all this going on in our world, I have the assignment today to inform you that all is not lost. There is still spiritual leadership amongst us who offer a new direction and a new purpose for our vulnerable society. They are the persons who serve as good interpreters of life. The persons who are being called on to understand and interpret our changing times. They are the ones whom I perceive have been drafted for this present age and carry the mantle of what I call the Essachar anointing. I've been tagged today with this duty to inform you that there is an Issachar anointing that rests and resides within the hollowed halls of Virginia Union. It is an, an unusual presence that surrounds the drum majors of our times and those connected to God. This anointing is not common, it's complex. This anointing is rare and not for the regular. There is a special oil on this kind of anointing that's unique in all of its components. It's distinct, set apart from the norm. It's discerning, aware, perceptive, astute, sensitive, and observant. This anointing is grace on those who have their attention on the pulse of the culture to know what's going on and what needs to to be done to advance and achieve the things necessary for the purpose of destiny's sake. This, this, this anointing requires of persons who are fighting the good fight, finishing the course, and keeping the faith. This, this anointing is not regulated for pulpit pimps. Person who desires Bentley is more so than blessing God's people. You, 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 here it is. You can't volunteer for this duty, watch this, because the ranks of this assignment are made up of draftees only. Okay, you missed what I just said. Yeah, the, the price one must pay to walk in this rank is considerable. And the ones who occupy this role have not walked the talk but also walk the walk. They are the veterans of spiritual combat. Like Paul, they bear the marks of battle on their souls. 
Paul said in Galatians 6, 17, from now on, don't let anyone trouble me with these things. For I bear on my body the scars that show my allegiance and alignment with Christ. It is because of this model of ministry that we must acknowledge the grace that encompasses the leadership that is being fashioned and formed through the hallowed halls of Virginia Union. This is not an easy anointing to bear because with this anointing comes an assignment, not one's ambition. Because when your ambition gets in the way, you abort God's assignment on your life. And when you abort God's assignment on your life, you get out of alignment with God. And then you want to have a pity party that you're not keeping up with what everybody else is doing. And you might not have understood that what everybody else is doing might not be for you. We have to come to the conclusion that we must bloom where we have been planted. Yeah, yeah. Quit, quit, quit desiring somebody else's anointing because you don't know the hell they had to go through with this kind of anointing resting on their lives. And so, therefore, the anointing, the anointing that I'm talking about informs, it instructs, and involves those whose purpose has led them to the doorstep of destiny. The anointing points people to a position of progress, productivity, and prosperity. Th th this anointing engages people of purpose and disciples of destiny to recognize that your time of promotion has come. Your time of elevation has arrived. This is your reason. This is your day. You are not just next. You are now. It's your time and it's your turn. It's your time and your turn to set the agenda, plot the course, and execute the plan. It's your time and your turn to be a change agent, a difference maker, a trendsetter, an influencer of your generations, a template for success. It's your time and your turn to start the business, write the book, mentor the generation, impact the community, rise above the status quo. It's your time. And your turn, it's your turn to get married, your turn to buy the house, your turn to sit at the table, and your turn to be the one of the culture, community, and church points to make it personal. This kind of anointing informs me it's my time and my turn. I want to submit to somebody in this house today that sooner has come. And it has turned in my favor because I'm covered by an Issachar anointing. Some of y'all looking at me strange. I know that we're in the seminary setting, but I just believe there's some church people in here who are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ who are not ashamed to aggravate your neighbor and tell your neighbor it's my time and it's my turn. You, you, don't what I, you don't know what I've been praying for. You don't know what I've been laboring for. Yes, I'm, in, I'm a studio student. Yes, I'm going through the training. But there's something that wells up on the inside of me that every now and then I have to call God and ask God why. And I heard God tell me to tell you, not just ask him why, because he's telling you now. I, I need about 10 of y'all that's excited about your now, that your now has come. What you have been praying for has arrived. Why? Because you have the Issachar anointing resting on your life. Before I get out of here, I want to show you how to know you are following the wisdom of, who, of one who walks in the Issachar anointing. First characteristic of one who has the Issachar anointing is, is, is one who is an intercessory prayer warrior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. These, these, these men knew what to do because I believe they were men of prayer. And if we're going to lead God's people anywhere, we got to be prayer warriors first. Come on, y'all ain't talking to me. <laughs> Ourselves. See, Issachar has recognized what is happening in the spirit. 
I, I, I know we, we got training. I know we've gone through all of the rigors of the classroom. But it ain't going to do you no good when you get in front of Negroes. You, oh God help me, you've got to have a prayer life. You, you, you've got to be able to see things in the spirit. You, you can't walk in the climate with everybody else. You've got to rise above and have a connection with God so that when things happen in the spirit realm, you can help it to shift into the natural. Okay, here it is. Isaiah 62, 6 says, O Jerusalem, I have posted watchmen on your walls. They will pray day and night, continually take no rest. All who pray to the Lord will get, will get clearance from God to move on his behalf. So therefore, he says, give the Lord no rest until he completes his work. There it is right there. You missed what I just said. It, when it's time to pray, you can't let God rest because you get tired. You got to keep on praying until God answers. I wish I had 35 prayer water in here that knows what prayer can do. Not only will prayer heal the sick, but prayer can shift you. Not only will prayer bring up walls so the enemy can't touch you, but prayer will prepare you so that when the enemy comes, you know how to handle him and don't fret nor sweat. Is there anybody in the room today that you, are, that you know you are a true prayer warrior? When that child was sick, you gave God no rest. When your body was in pain, you gave God no rest. When you needed money to pay your bills, you gave God no rest. Give the Lord no rest until he completes his work. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, he's still working on me. God ain't through with me yet. He's, he's still working on me. You can act like you're cute and acculturated and sophisticated and all that if you want to. But if I got up under your skin and walked in your house, I'll discover that there's some mess going on. There's some chaos that's going on in your house that you need God to clean up. And all of us have to go to God in prayer for God to complete what he started on the inside of us. Look at what the text says in Isaiah 62, 6, 6. It says, not only give God no rest and, and, and until he completes his work, but until he makes Jerusalem the pride of the earth. Okay, you missed what I just said. That, that, that God wants you and I to talk to him so that he can point you out as his pride. <laughs> when, when, when the enemy thought they had him down, I raised him up. And so now I can point to them because not only are they walking in victory, they're walking in my glory. You got to be, you got to be an intercessory prayer warrior. The intercessory prayer warrior is one who is covered by the Issachar anointing. But the second thing, the second characteristic of one who walks in the Issachar anointing is that they are spiritually awake and alert. Holy Spirit showed me something, y'all, that this is the first Woke movement. I, I live in a state where the governor says that you come to, well, it, it's the state where woke came to die. But I, I beg to differ with him because we've been woke all along. See, because Issachars don't run and hide, they rise and shine. That, that, that's why you are here. You are here not to fall prey to the board or fall prey to the structure. But when things get rough, you and I run to the trouble. We are strong and alert in the Lord. We are the ones who are not lulled to sleep by lies, turning our heads to what men, media, and manipulative entities have to say. Rather, those of us with the Issachar anointing are strong in the Lord because we, don't, we do not fear, but we focus on him and his word. The Lord is the anchor of our souls, our minds, our wills, and our emotions. We fortify what the hearts of men should be and what God has called us to be. We have, we have the kind of anointing that's strong and unlike Samson fall, for example, we do not fall at the whimper and the will of humanity. We are strong. We, we welcome a tussle. 
about it. We, we welcome a fight. Yeah, we, we've been built for this. Yeah. I, I've got I've got a makeup that 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 tells the enemy you in for a fight. No weapon, y'all in formed against me shall be able to prosper. Let me rush on. Third characteristic of one who walks in the Issachar anointing is that they have an understanding, finally, y'all, of the time. Yeah, the Bible speaks of chronos time, with chrono which is chronological time, and kairos time, which is a specific time. Those with the Issachar anointing understand chronological time and understand specific time. They understand the spiritual and political climates and timing. These times we live in can either cause us to come into agreement with fear or faith. God is pouring out the Issachar anointing, releasing kingdom discernment and knowledge about what to do for the times we are living in. I love to hear what my grandfather used to sing the old hymn uh, for that the, the hymn said, uh, for this age we serve, for this age that we serve is a time that needs people who are in tune with God to serve this present age. Yeah, our calling to fulfill. The Bible says in, in 1 Chronicles 12, from the tribe of Issachar, there were 200 leaders of the tribe with their relatives. Watch this. All these men understood the signs of the times and knew the best course for Israel to take. And so finally, y'all, the fourth characteristic of one who walks in the Issachar anointing is that they act when wickedness is released. Issachars take action. They do and activate the words of God. Daniel 11, 32 through 35 describes a situation when the Issachar anointing is released. Wickedness is in the land. And there are powers that come against the covenant. They are corrupt, flattery. Lies that tickle ears, but the people who know their God are strong and carry out great exploits. In other words, when wickedness comes against the covenant of God, those with the Issachar anointing are empowered by the Spirit to take action and do great exploits. They do not stand by complaining and criticizing. They understand there will be opposition, but they see the opposition as a road to refinement. In Daniel 11, it says he will flatter and win over those who have violated the covenant. But the people who know their God will be strong and will resist him. Wise leaders give instruction to many. But these teachers will die by fire and sword, or they will be jailed and robbed. During these persecutions, little help will arrive, and then many of them will join in with others and not be sincere. And some of the wise will fall victim to persecution. In this way, they will be refined and cleansed and made pure until the time of the end. For the appointed time will come. And so therefore, people of God, you need to understand that this Ishakar anointing is not a cheap one. It's one that has the favor of God resting on it. Because those of us in this setting have been called out from amongst them to be seers of that, what is going on in the spirit. We have been called out from amongst them to be the revealers of what God is doing in the spirit. We have been called out from amongst them to carry out the bloodstained banner. I said, we have been called from, anoint from amongst them to make sure that men and women understand what God has for them. And I've come to be a revealer today that what God has for me is for me. I'm 
go into my seat, y'all, but uh, the seals begin in second and first chronicles. But I believe over in the New Testament, there is a new seer that showed up on the horizon. My granddaddy said he came through 40 and two generations. Y'all ain't hearing me yet. His bloodline reaches all the way back to the tribe of Judah. And when he came, he came in the fullness of time. He was able to see what the prophets could not see. He was able to see, yeah, what the Pharisees and the Sadducees could not see. He was able to see beyond Calvary. For the Bible says that this man named Jesus, yeah, walked on water, healed the sick, opened blinded eyes on his way to his destiny. He saw that all of us were in a fixed situation. We were on our way to hell in a handbasket. But aren't you glad that this man named Jesus saw our victory uh, beyond the cross uh, because one Friday evening uh, yeah they caught up with him uh, they grabbed him in the garden uh, rushed him to Pilate's palace uh, he went through hell all night long uh, but he was able to see uh, if I complete my assignment uh, 2,000 years later uh, there are going to be some more seers uh, in Virginia Union uh, who go gain victory because I conquered death, hell, and the grave. Uh, and if I could go back to Jacksonville, uh, might not ever get here again. Uh, but while I'm here, uh, I'm gonna let you know uh, what I grew up finding out uh, that late Friday night uh, they hung him on a hill. Uh, late Friday night uh, they nailed him to a cross. Uh, late Friday. Friday night, uh, they put a crown of thorns on his head. Uh, late Friday night, uh, they whipped him all night long. Uh, and I heard, uh, where my real church folk at? Uh, I heard uh, that Jesus said, uh, Father, forgive them, uh, for they know not what they do. Uh, and the Bible said, uh, he died. Uh, tap a neighbor and say, yes, he did die. He died till the earth reeled and rocked. He died till the honey moon started hemorrhaging. He died until there was a thief hanging on the right. So I don't know whether you are the son of God or not, but just in case you are, please remember me. And Jesus said, this day, you will be with me uh, in paradise. Uh, and he died and hung his head in the lock of his shoulders. Uh, and you know we heard it uh, from Dr. Jones back in the day. Uh, he said, it is um, finished. Uh, it's all over. The destiny has been completed. Uh, but aren't you glad uh, that he didn't stay dead? Because early... Sunday morning, early, Sunday morning, early, Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand, and I don't know about you, but I want that same kind of anointing on my life, look at your neighbor, ask your neighbor, are you anointed? Do you have the oil? If you got the oil, you ought to say something. If you got the oil, you ought to make some noise. If you got the oil, you ought to open your mouth. If you got the oil, you ought to praise his name. Pull on your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm oily. I'm oily. I'm oily. Call on my roommate and send my 
seminary. Won't it do it? Won't it do it? Won't it do it? Won't it fight your battle? Won't it dry your tears? Won't it make a way? Won't it, won't it, won't it, won't it? Listen, I don't care what nobody say. We can walk around here talking grown if you want. But ain't nothing like a good early Sunday morning. The thing that made sitting with Dr. Jones so impactful was he always told us, find a charisma. Jesus is in every text. Can we give God praise? No, can we give God praise? This is a season where we need discerning leadership. It was kind of interesting as I heard him thinking about some of the conversations that I have in our school as we're wrestling with the direction of our school, the direction of theological education, the direction of theological education in black space. What does that mean? What does that look like? I was challenged by that message today because this is a new day. So I want to thank God for the preacher. What a great season this is for preaching. So we're going to start to uh, transition, but a couple of things we need to do. One, I'm going to ask them to put up the QR code for students to sign up for the luncheon. And I want students who have yet to do it to go ahead and do it uh, if you want to come to the luncheon. We do it now for alumni, of course it is, we, the expectation is that you will pay, right? But we do have spaces available. Um, so, so students, if you want to join us for the luncheon, please, uh, that will then transition into time with, with Dean Emeritus Kenny. Uh, I've made a commitment that as long as I'm Dean, there will always be a John Kenny Hour uh, in, in honor of the longest serving Dean in the history of Sam DeWitt Proctor School of Theology. He's definitely going to be longer serving than me. Yeah. <laughs> Thou believest that. That's my King James Version. <laughs> I wish I was joking, but I is not. <laughs> I have deserved the times that it ain't 27 years. So we want to we wanna make sure that we're in position to do that. Um, this next segment is going to be conversations for the next two hours or so. We have sat and looked at necessary areas to have conversation as it relates to social justice, social transformation. I'm going, to, I'm going to give an alert. You may or may not agree, morally, spiritually, or otherwise, from the content. But you do not come to seminary to be told that you're right. You come to seminary to be challenged from different views. Ellison Jones is not a Bible college environment. We are not conservative in thought, nor safe in conversation and so I want you to be open for every thing said and then I want you to go away and then breaks have conversations about it I don't I don't want to 
lead a seminary that's scared to think. Because what you may discover is maybe there are other ways of doing this or seeing this. So we have some incredible topics, persons who are content experts and persons who take seriously what they do. So it's 1010. Come on, stand. We'll start at 1020. We need to be at the luncheon by about 1230, 1245. So we're going to move this. We're going to move this. I've asked Dr. Howard. I think he stepped out for a moment to provide leadership for this. And uh, so come on, stand. And we'll take about 10 minutes. Breathe, greet, and uh, breathe, greet. Amen. And all of our presenters for this first conversation, please come.